So now I want to take you through a beautiful example of real world chaos that you can produce at home. It's the chaotic dripping of a faucet. And these experiments were conceived and carried out and published by a, a, a very important group in the history of chaos, the uh, UC Santa Cruz Chaos Cabal, uh, which was very strong and did a lot of important work in the 70s and 80s. And I just have to mention their names. Uh, Doyne Farmer, uh, Norm Packard, Jim Crutchfield, Rob Shaw, and their advisor, Ralph Abraham. They did a lot of groundbreaking work on this subject. And one of the simple things that they set out to study was the chaotic rhythms of a dripping faucet. So let's look at the dripping faucet. And the parameter we're going to control is the flow rate of the fluid by opening the handle. Now, you know, everybody knows, that for very low flow rates, if you just open the handle a little bit, and by the way, if you're doing this at home, uh, make sure there's no aerator on the faucet. It's just a naked opening. It works a lot better. If we just open the faucet a little bit and produce slow dripping, that slow dripping is periodic. And you see drip, 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 drip. Now, if you make a Poincaré plot of the inter-drip intervals, because that is going to be our data, we're going to take the time intervals between the drips, we're going to call those inter-drip intervals T1, T2, T3. And we're going to plot Tn plus 1 against Tn to look for determinism. So for low flow rates, as you see, you get perfectly periodic dripping. Now if you increase the flow rate carefully, and this is well before full-on flow, where you're like washing your hands. It's still dripping, but it's dripping faster. And you can easily get a regime where you can get a period two, a period doubling, in which the faucet does drip, 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 drip. In other words, a short interval followed by a long interval, followed by a short interval, followed by a long interval. So that is period two dripping from the faucet. If you're very careful, you can produce more complex periodic rhythms. And then if you're super careful and still open the faucet, and just to give you an idea of how much the dripping should sound like drip, 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 but still discrete drips, but very fast. When you do that, you will see that the dripping becomes irregular. And the Santa Cruz group made plots of Tn plus 1 against Tn, the n plus first interdrip interval against the nth interdrip interval. And this is what they saw. So these are very striking. These are definitely not blobs. 
They're very low dimensional geometric figures. Uh, some of them actually look like the parabola map, some of them are more complex, but none of them are just a round blob of points. And the low dimensional structure is indicative and entails the fact that this is not randomness, that the irregularity is not random, that the irregularity of the dripping faucet is in fact chaos. And we have seen not just chaos, but we have seen a classic route to chaos as we transition from periodic to complex periodic to chaotic behavior. Now let's ask, what is the mechanism of this chaos? What is causing this chaos? And in order to understand that, we need to look up close at the faucet itself and how it's dripping. So here's the faucet. And the water is coming out this way. And here's the aperture. And the water flows and it begins to balloon due to the increasing flow here. It begins to balloon and then as it balloons, part of it separates and drops and the undropped part then relaxes back into the faucet giving a little oscillation. And you can actually see those oscillations in this figure, which is taken by an extremely high speed camera. And as a matter of fact, if you are taking a shower so that this uh, tap, this outlet here is at eye level, you, you can actually see the little oscillations on the recovery of the undropped part of the drip. So we have a sequence of events. Water flows, drop expands, drop separates, undropped portion relaxes back into the faucet with a little oscillation. So, I have now described a process that has two time constants built into it. The first time constant is the rate of formation. I'm going to call them rate constants. And the first one is R1, which is the rate of drop formation. And that's, for example, for slow dripping, that's R1 is about one per second. Drip, drip, drip. And that can get faster or slower. And then R2, and I'm going to say this is around, for slow dripping, this is around one second. R2 is the relaxation time of the undripped drip and the little oscillation phase. The relaxation time of the undropped portion. And that is a lot shorter. That's on the order of a tenth of a second. But that's for slow dripping. And the key to the periodic behavior of the slow dripping is that R1 is much greater than R2. Or actually the rate, I should say, the rate is much slower than R2. The time interval is much greater. One second is greater than a tenth of a second. 
And what that means is you have a process, the drop forms, the drop separates, the undropped part does its little relaxation. And then everything is quiet. Now the next drop is forming and the same scenario is going to be repeated. And the key here is that there's a separation in the time scales so that this recovery process here, the undropped part, the recovery process is fast compared to the forward formation of the next action. Now let's open the faucet a little further and now it's going drip, 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 drip. That's about a half a second. Let's go even faster. Drip, 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 drip. That's around a tenth of a second. And now the two are occurring at the same time scale. And what's happening is the forward formation of the N plus first drop is critically affected, the time is critically affected by the exact state of the relaxation from the previous drop. If this little oscillation is going down as this thing prepares to separate, the separation is retarded in time. If this little thing is going up while the separation is about to take place, the separation is accelerated in time. So the time of formation of the N plus first drip is critically dependent on the exact state of the relaxation from the previous drip because the forward formation is happening so fast that the forward formation of the N plus first drop is stepping on the toes of the relaxation from the previous drop. And uh, as a general lesson, which they draw from this example, whenever a process consists of an action phase and a recovery phase, and the process is being driven at a nice slow rate, and by slow I mean slow with respect to the time constant of the recovery phase. When that system is being driven slowly, the system has plenty of time to recover before the next action comes. But when that process is pushed fast so that the forward formation of the next action is stepping on the toes of the uncompleted relaxation from the previous action, you are going to get complex behavior. And that is a mechanism of chaos which is very general as you'll see in another example. This idea, this, this mechanism for chaos of a system that is being driven periodically and is being driven at a rate faster than the system can react completely to the previous excitation is a very powerful and very general mechanism. You saw it in the dripping faucet. But you can also see it in a very, very simple experiment. Maybe when you were a kid, you had a toy. It was very popular when I was a kid. Um, it was a big balloon that was the size, it was your size. And it was a big balloon and it was weighted at the bottom. And it had the property that you punched it and it leaned over and then it righted itself. And you would punch it and it would lean over and it would right itself. So I want to stylize that experiment. Here is the object. It's hinged on a table and it's going to have a spring right there. Then 
there's going to be a punching bag here. And the punching bag is going to strike the object. The object is going to tilt this way, and then the spring is going to push it back up. So there's a very simple experiment, and we're going to, instead of having a kid doing it, we're going to have a punching bag machine just periodically punching that object, which is going to tilt and then come back due to the spring. So let's now take a very slow punching rate. What's going to happen? It's going to punch, the object is going to go down, the object is going to come back up. Everything is going to wait. Here comes the second punch. It's going to be identical to the first punch. And the object is going to go down and it's going to come back up and then everything is going to wait for the third punch. So it's clear that for a slow punching rate, and again, by what do I mean by slow? I mean long time relative to the recovery time of the toy. How long does it take that toy to spring back up? That's our second time constant, and our first time constant is the punching rate. And if the punching rate is nice and slow, compared to the time constant of recovery, the system will be periodic. Now suppose we increase the punching rate. Now, look at what's going to happen. Here's punch number one, and it's going to drive the system down, let's say to here. And then the system is going to start to come back. But when the system is back in this phase, the second punch is going to occur. That punch is not going to meet a resting toy. It's going to meet a toy that's halfway back or three quarters of the way back. But now the force of the punch is going to be different because this is not perpendicular anymore. And there is now a sine function or a cosine function that's going to modulate the force of this, the second punch. And that's going to produce a different excursion downward and a different excursion upward. And now the third punch is going to come and it's going to catch that object at yet a different state. So as soon as we start punching rapidly, we're encountering the toy at a slightly different state. And that means the force of our punch is going to be slightly different. And we're going to get irregular behavior out of the punching machine if the punching is fast relative to the relaxation of the toy.